Being a startup founder is like playing a never-ending game of chess, except the pieces keep changing, the board is on fire, and nobody knows the rules. This is Startups for the Rest of Us. I'm your host, Rob Walling. That joke, not very good, was written by ChatGPT, if you can believe it. I think ChatGPT is good at a lot of things, but it's still working out its humor. This week, I have a great conversation with one of the authors of Forget the Funnel. Gia Lotti and Claire Swellentrop run an agency that works with SaaS companies to help them grow their businesses. It's called Forget the Funnel, and their book is called Forget the Funnel. And so if you're already sold on this or you get two minutes into the interview and you want to pick it up, it's on Amazon. You can just search for Forget the Funnel. But the book dives deep into jobs to be done with very specific examples where they have used it to help companies improve their onboarding rates, to help them grow their businesses overall, to find more customers like the ones that are already successful using their product. And what I like about the book, you'll hear me say in the conversation, is it's short, it's compact, doesn't waste your time, and it has a lot of extremely concrete examples from their experience doing this for clients. But before we dive into that, if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, I'm releasing effectively a Rob Solo adventure Every week, 52 weeks a year over at microconf.com slash YouTube. It's a 10 to 15 minute video covering all the topics that you would hear us discuss on this podcast. So it's things like idea validation. It's how to improve your marketing and sales funnel, how to hire, who to hire. And I even told my story of buying, growing and selling Hittail and building and selling Drip. And I told them in a way, like a compact format, in a way that I haven't done really on this podcast or in any on-stage talks that I've done. So while the content on the YouTube channel is in the same spirit as this podcast, it's not the same stuff regurgitated. It's genuinely new content covering new topics. So microconf.com slash YouTube if you're into that sort of thing. And with that, let's dive into my conversation with Gialotti. Gialotti, thanks for joining me on the show. Thanks for having me, Rob. So we're going to be talking about Forget the Funnel, which is the name of the book that you co-authored with Claire Swellentrop. Folks who listen to this podcast will recognize Claire's name. She's spoken at MicroConf multiple times. She's been on MicroConf on air. And uh, you actually spoke at MicroConf Remote. In what about six, eight months ago. So the subtitle of Forget the Funnel is A Customer-Led Approach for Driving Predictable Recurring Revenue. And the first thing I noticed about the book, as I normally do, is, man, this is amazingly short. I love 150, 200 page books. When I pick up a book, a business book that is 400 pages, 450, I'm instantly like, this is bull****. Like some ghostwriter pulled a bunch of anecdotes about Microsoft and Intuit from the 80s to pad it so it looks big on it, right? And when I see, you know, obviously Awesome by April Dunford, when I see Forget the Funnel 150, or like my own books, I was telling you offline, like 200 pages is about where I stop. And if I need more than that, I'm going to write a separate book. So I'm curious if that was an intentional decision on your part. 100%. Um, I definitely uh, took a page, so to speak, from April there. Uh, I remember hearing her talk about having a bunch of like coffee chats with founders and they all described how they read books as being like on a flight. And so she was like, okay, so it's got to be read in a flight. And I figured, you know, if I can, if I can (laughs) take a lesson from April, which I will take all of them, her goal was to write half a book. And, uh, you know, all the sort of fallacies around like, why does a book need to be 300 or 400 pages or, you know, over 30 K words. And it's like about all about the spine of the book being wide enough. And it's actually pretty arbitrary. And so, yeah, we were pretty dedicated to write a short and also useful book. So April, big influence there, Rob Fitzpatrick as well. I would say between the two of them, they were very, very close to Claire and I, as we were writing the, writing this out. Uh, Rob Fitzpatrick, did he write the mom test, right? He wrote the mom test, but he also wrote two other books. And one of them was called Write Useful Books. And then he wrote another one about workshops. I'm forgetting the name of it right now. But Write Useful Books was really the book that inspired the the brevity in this one. Also, another sort of aspect of this that it had to be short was a lot of what we talk about in the book is very practical and very tactical. And so we were like, well, we can't go down that rabbit hole. Cause we need a whole, like we need a video walkthrough for that, or we need a template or a tool to communicate how to do this specific thing. So there's a lot of sections in the book where you'll get to, where it's like actually to dive into how to do this process. We've got this other resource over here. So we've got a, a complimentary workbook as well, which 
is laughably almost as long as the book itself. It's like 110 pages and it's all tools and stuff to sort of make use of the, the core material. And so, you know, we're going to dive into a bit, uh, obviously we can't cover the whole book in a podcast, but we're going to dive into a bit the concept you came up with called customer-led growth, right? Not product-led growth. But I want to first kick us off by finding out a lot of listeners to this podcast, a lot of different stages from idea to literally eight-figure SaaS companies. What is the ideal stage for this book? So the, the companies that will get the most amount of value out of this book or the teams, I should say, are definitely those who have happily paying customers. So you've got a product, whether or not, you know, whatever your vision might be for it, you might, obviously you're going to be continuing to evolve your product, but as long as you've got customers happily paying for it today, you can get value. The other aspect of this that I would say if you are in a situation where you've got a product that, you know, you have these happily paying customers, but you're in this situation where you're like, why haven't I yet figured out how to sort of articulate what we do? Why do I feel like I'm not doing a good enough job describing what we do to our target customer? And why haven't we been able to bring more people through the front door and activate them in the product? That's the other sort of flip side of this is that you've gotten to this point where you've got high retention, high value, very happy customers, but now you're like, okay, how do I take this thing to the next level? That's also who would be uh, a great fit for this, for the book. Got it. So it's it's like a, I think of it as a growth book. You know, that term growth hacking and all that growth marketing came out, whatever, it started becoming popular a decade ago. Marketing has always been drive leads to a point and then they stop. Usually it's like started a free trial. Cool, I'm out of here. Hey, right? Marketing like moves on to the next thing. But it feels like to me, growth goes much deeper than that, right? Growth looks inside the product and says, people aren't onboarding. What do we need to change here? How can we then find more of them? How can we retain them all that, right? Is that, that's that's what Forget the Funnel is about. So sort of, I, I disagree a little that marketing is solely responsible for leads. In some organizations, yep, 100%, that is the understanding for marketing, that you know, marketing is responsible for going out in the world, finding customers who are a good fit for this product, bringing them to the front door, and then converting them on the website. That's some people's understanding of marketing as, as ending there. We are pretty uh, bullish about marketing's role post-acquisition. So through product activation, getting to value within the product, product retention, uh, continued engagement, you know, customer education, expansion, customer marketing, right? Like really even post solving the customer's problem. So we'd think of marketing as being very sort of holistic and spanning the entire customer experience. Now you may not call it marketing. Some people call that product marketing. Some people call that customer success. Yeah, you know, customer success. But also some product teams think about, you know, the customer experience through that lens and and think about optimizing all of those different areas of the customer experience. So we think of it as and describe it primarily as product marketing, but because product marketing is so wildly misunderstood, we have a hard time using that that term. It's getting a little better than it was when we, you know, first started out, but product marketing is a good way to think about it. Growth is one of those terms that I just like, I can't, I, I, what was marketing doing before the growth term came around? Like as if, you know, marketing wasn't focused on growth anyway, but I understand that there is a, there is a, an understanding and a function for growth within a lot of companies that have, a, a, is very well defined as being sort of in that middle of the funnel. So I get that. So yes, I would say it's kind of all of the above, but predominantly what brings people to this, like, we got to solve this you know, scalable customer sort of growth or, you know, acquisition is they think it's marketing. They think, oh, we need more traffic to this website. We need to find out where people are. Marketing's not working. We need to figure out, you know, our messaging. That's what the founders and the teams that come to us think is the problem that they're solving is like, we just need more people to the front door. And people think of that as a marketing problem to be solved. But truthfully, what ends up happening is we do tip over to the other side and we see that actually you've got this opportunity post sign up to introduce your product in more advantageous ways and optimize that experience post acquisition, help customers get from trial or free into paid, uh, help them reach value as quickly as possible, and then turn them into really high LTV customers. So even though they thought they were coming to us and they, they think that this is a marketing problem, actually what they discover is that like, oh, it's really a lot more holistically. So yeah, and that's kind of the, that's the battle we're picking with the funnel too. 
Yeah, and and I want to talk about funnels in just a second, but in the book you say, we call this three-phase process the customer-led growth framework. It's the method we use to help companies of all sizes calm the marketing chaos and hit ambitious revenue targets. And the three steps are, number one, get inside your best customers' heads, which you talk copiously about uh, doing interviews. A lot of some surveys, but a lot of interviews. Step two, map and measure your customers' experience. And step three, unlock your biggest growth opportunities. So CLG... I, you don't call it that, do you? I? I call it that because I, I like call acronyms. It CLG. But is that is that something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you? Oh, that's cool. Because everyone's talking product led growth these days, and I'm like, yeah, slow down. Like you're not Slack, but customer led growth is is a nice framing of this thing. You have something in the market. You have some customers that are being successful with it. But what do you do next, right? And that that feels like what the whole book is about. Yeah, we're definitely not anti-PLG. We love, if anything, we lean towards more product-led companies. And I I really, really believe that in order to be successful as a product-led product or business, you need to intimately understand your customers so that you can create effective and scalable experiences for them. If you don't understand your customers, you don't understand, you don't understand what led them to sign up or what motivates them to choose you and what parts of the product deliver that value, you're not going to be able to create scalable product led experiences for them. So CLG is actually a perfect fit for product led companies. In fact, the majority of the companies that we work with are product led. And so let's talk about funnels a little bit, because when I hear the book title is Forget the Funnel, and that's also the name of the agency you run, correct? You and and Claire? Yeah. So see, I was a developer, and then I became a marketer, and I learned about funnels, and I actually like funnels. So I don't want to forget the funnel. But the more I read read your book, I was like, oh, it's a cool name. It's super memorable. But they don't want me to forget the funnel. This actually helps optimize my funnel. This makes my funnel way more effective. That's how I was interpreting it. Do you agree with that? Uh, I mean, yes and no. It, it's I find that those tools like that, like funnels or pirate metrics or, you know, life cycle, sort of the MQL, SQL, like kind of life cycle uh, terminology and, and tools that we use, they're helpful for teams to think about and communicate about, you know, what parts of the customer experience we're trying to optimize for. And it's, it, it, they help facilitate conversation. And, and I still use the term funnel, like, you know, when we're talking about awareness level marketing campaigns, you know, we might slip in a, it's the top of the funnel in a couple of conversations, but truthfully it is like, that's kind of where their value ends in that, it's a helpful communication tool. It's helpful for creating context. It's helpful because it's so sort of well understood. It's helpful for making sure that you're talking about the same thing, uh, you know, with in other conversation with others. But again, it kind of ends there because my my biggest bone to pick, I think, with with those models are that they're generic. And the idea here is that your product, your customers. And your team even, you know, you're unique. And if you're thinking about your customers as falling into the same buckets of sort of experiences as all the other products and all the other customers out in the world, you're losing that nuance, you're losing that customer understanding and that depth of understanding that can help you be really, really successful. The other actually thing I would say about funnels is that they have this like sort of beginning and an end and the, we're in recurring revenue business here. Like we're all trying to, you know, build a product that serves customers over the long term, builds a relationship with them, you know, high LTV sort of relationships and funnels don't account for that. I've seen the upside down funnels and the I've seen all of that shit. And still, you know, it still doesn't do the job of communicating that like we're in a relationship here and it's about helping you get value and helping to solve a problem for you and not only solving that problem, but what happens after that, right? What happens after we've, somebody's become a customer and they've built a habit around our product. The the story does not end there, right? Where SaaS gets really, really interesting is after that stage, when we start to get into expansion opportunities and, you know, net revenue retention and those kinds of conversations, that's where things get really, really interesting in the world of SaaS. You know, that is typically not thought about until like later stages of growth, but that's where things get really, really interesting. And so this has a little bit more legs as well. It also feels less gross for teams to sort of talk about like, oh, well, our customers are, we're trying to help customers get to first value, or we want to help our customers reach full value realization. That's better than saying I'm building a campaign for bottom of funnel. 
right? Like it just, it's more meaningful. It pays a level of respect to the teams creating the programs as much as it does the customers. It just kind of elevates the conversation a little bit. Yeah, I often think of funnels and funnel metrics. Like I have all my rules of thumb of if you ask for a credit card or don't, and it's a bunch of numbers, it's great. But it's the moment you ask, well, why? Don't know, funnel doesn't care. It's like going to Amazon and seeing a bunch of one-star reviews and a bunch of five-star ratings without the full review and being like, well, we, look, we got all these one-star reviews. Why? Don't know. There's no actual review, right? So, and that's what a funnel is, is a funnel tells you numbers and I can look at a SaaS business and say, ooh, trial to paid's really messed up. That's a problem. You need to fix that, right? And that, to me, that's a great quantitative thing to know, but there is no, the moment you say why, it's like, now you have to go start talking to people. Now you have to do all the things to find out why it's broken. And that's where I feel like as I read through Forget the Funnel, I was like, yes, this is the why. This answers the why of how to make this better. Something I really liked, obviously a lot of jobs to be done stuff in the, in the book. One of the most helpful, I mean, it's like six or seven bullets in a row. It's on page 24 of the book and I was reading through it and it said, you know, in order to get inside your best customers' heads, you need to understand. And then it's these bullets. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. It just gets better and better. The first is what life was like for your customer before they started using your solution. What happened that made them realize this isn't working? I need something else. What they did next and next and next until they found you. What led them to choose you over all the other options? What value they experienced? And there's a couple more. I won't read them all. But it's like, this is like textbook to me, at least as I, I'm not a jobs to be done expert, but as I understand jobs to be done, this is a, like a switch interview, right? Is that the context? Yeah. So many people who are listening to this have no idea what I just said, like what that means. And I know that like most of the best founders I know, they either directly know this about jobs to be done or they intuitively do it without knowing they're doing it. They, they're talking to customers and they're just in their customers' heads because they're so close to the metal. So you want to talk a little bit about that, expand on kind of how I've introed this? Yeah. So thank you for reading that and not making me remember what they all were. <laughs> Although I know you didn't get to the end of the list. Uh, this, so the idea there is definitely to have that bird's eye view or how we sort of describe it as like that documentary understanding of your customer's you know relationship with you from before they even knew you existed. So a lot of times I'll be on calls with founders and I'll ask, who are your best customers and what led them to sign up? What was that moment that your ideal customers decided that they had to solve this problem or that they couldn't go on with life anymore the way it was? And many of them just sort of stare blankly like they don't know the answer. They want to answer this question like, well, they, you know, they're at companies of 100 plus employees and they're in this certain vertical. And we know they have titles that sound like these, but they don't really understand the why, as you were saying before, of like what led to somebody to actually sign up? What was that pain? What was that struggling moment that led to somebody seeking out a solution like yours? And then what was that, you know, life and that, that experience rather of going from, holy shit, I can't live like this. There's got to be a better way. Who do they go and talk to? What conversations do they have? Where do they go? What water and holes did they hang out in? Who did they, you know, try to have some conversations with? Who were the, or what were the influences that sort of led them to find you and discover you? And then what was it about your solution? And, and I'll even talk from, from a website perspective, what was it about your website or marketing materials that convinced them to try the thing? And then once they got into the product, what was it that convinced them to keep going? There's a, an amazing question that we ask in research, which is like, what was it that convinced you that, you know, this was going to solve your problem? And the answer to just that question can give you so much insight into, you know, what sort of not only experience you should provide once somebody gets into your product for the first time, but also what you should be the carrot to dangle, so to speak, on the website and the the, the way to sort of message and position your, your product for them. So having that deep level of understanding and really at the all the way from experiencing the problem through to singing your praises or even expanded product usage is kind of what we're getting at there. Like having that holistic understanding, like I was describing before, that funnels just don't do that good of a job of, but it really gets you that intimate understanding into why somebody chooses you. And just from getting that understanding, you can do a ton. Like you'll, the world sort of opens up to you in, ter in terms of opportunity. It's a good thing and a bad thing when a bunch of opportunities open up to you. So there's a very specific process that we talk about to sort of to like deconstruct the customer experience and 
start thinking about your customer's experience through the lens of like these milestones or leaps of faith that your customers have in your relationship with you so that you can really figure out like what are those moments of value that we need to help customers reach and then once they've reached them then move them on to the next sort of moment of value that's the operationalizing of that understanding that we were just describing in that documentary there are a bunch of people listening to this who either do this natively, intuitively, or they have red jobs to be done and implemented it because it is such a, it was such a game changer as it's hit our space. But there's also a big chunk who I think don't do it. And there are skeptical of the value. You mean of the research side of things? Yeah, of the t- like we say talk to customers a lot. I, I guess I'd, I'll start with by saying we say talk to customers a lot. We all say this, and people say, "What do I ask?" Well, read, forget the funnel, because there's a great list of questions on page. I think it's 54. I might we might even get to them in this. Uh, I might do another dramatic reading of your own words back to you. <laughs> but I mean, it's just a really good list of questions. But I think for someone who's listening to this and they do have successful customers and whether they're doing 10K a month or you know 100K a month, if you don't know what's working, then when it stops working, how do you fix it? That's the thing, right? And that's what, even if it's working well, I still think that you need to be having these conversations with your customer. Product market fit is a moving target in almost every space. Even if you found it and everything is working today, is the market going to be the same in eight months, in 10 months, in two years? It's unlikely, you know, unless you're in a, like a really regulated space or for some other reason. Yeah. Or you add somebody to the team or start working with somebody else who is responsible for creating materials or, you know, collateral or programs to help your customers. And they don't maybe have that same intuitive understanding of your customers that you do. Um, So that's another advantage to doing the research and operationalizing it is that it can be used with your team. And it sort of democratizes that customer understanding for everyone who's working on your product and supporting, you know, its growth. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, actually. That was a struggle. So at my last SaaS company, Drip, my co-founder and I were there from day one. It was just the two of us, and we knew our customers inside and out. We didn't have it from the start, but by the time we built the product up, we were years into it. It's like we just knew it. The moment we tried to explain any of this, like a new engineer or a designer, or frankly, our first product person we hired when we were at a couple million ARR, I was like, huh, I'm not sure how to communicate any of this. So it was just a huge interview. I was like, all right, ask me questions. And then the, the cool part is one of them did, he was a, an experienced professional product manager. And so unlike us hacks who just figured our way, you know, way through it, but he did put together a ton of documents based on that. That would have been way easier if, and, and he actually did go and do a bunch of this. He asked a bunch of, you know, maybe not switch questions, but he did talk to a lot of customers to to try to codify it in a way that wasn't just, you know, how co-founders are. They're just like, I don't know. We just kind of got here. You know, we figured our way out. <laughs> just ask me. I know the answers. Just ask me. I'm right, exactly. I'm right here. Super helpful. And that totally works when there are 10 of you. And when I left, there were 120 of us. It didn't work anymore because mm-hmm. everybody was asking me everything, you know, and it's like, no, you have to at a certain point scale it. So, so I do want to get to these, some of these questions I was just reading up again. And th- this is the type of stuff. Uh, Michelle Hansen's book, Deploy Empathy, is tactical like this. I really like it. Forget the Funnel is the same way where at like every few pages I'm like, oh my gosh, a list of questions. Oh, this is exactly either what I used to ask or I would ask them in different ways or I should have asked that and didn't. And it's that type of stuff, right? Where it's very prescriptive in a way that I like especially because I'm not a professional at this. Like, I don't know this stuff intuitively. I'm not a professional product manager. I just am figuring it out. But here's like a few of the questions. How are you using product name today? When did you first start using product name? Okay, so with that timeline in mind, take me back to life before product name. Prior to using this product, what were you using instead? If you were using a combination of tools, what were they? Tell me about the moment you realized old way wasn't cutting it. This is is good. What caused that moment? What compelled you to look for something different? Where did you go to look for new solutions? Did you try anything else? And there's like five or six more just on that page, right? So is this from you and Claire, like just doing these interviews a kajillion times? Yeah. um, I mean, some of these questions are like best practices. And also I'm sure some of them come straight from Bob Mesta, truthfully. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they are the sort of gold standard style of questions. I don't know that, you know, if you go look for jobs to be done interview questions, you'd probably find similar-ish questions to this. This is the way that we like to word them. And with the right interviewer, mind you, 
amazing, amazing insight can, can come out of asking those questions. An insight that is not only just interesting and insightful, but also can be used and actioned and actually turn into something that the team can you know, create some experiences for and optimize for in the short term and also build upon as, like you said, the product evolves, the market evolves and your customers evolve. So yeah, we really like them. And yeah, that's definitely a popular, a popular list for us for sure. Yeah. I like having it here in one place. And so to give folks an idea, we can say talk to customers and we can say talk to potential customers or talk to cancel customers, right? I mean, talk to whatever to get this information. And then am I right that this information you gather, you're using it to inform our marketing copy, our messaging, our positioning, our onboarding, even our product direction, right? Even like features? Yeah. So one thing I just want to back back up a bit on is churned customers would probably not be the right fit for this type of research. And the, the reason being that we want to learn from the customers who have been successful with your product. I'm not saying there's no place for win-loss analysis or exit interviews. There absolutely is. And, you know, you should be learning from customers in that way, but not if you haven't done this style of research first. So we're really trying to figure out, you know, of those customers who are really successful with your product that represent what you believe to be a really great opportunity for the future of your company. What are those customers' answers to these questions? It is more challenging to do with potential customers for obvious reasons. You know, you can't ask them about like, what was it about our product? Like, obviously they don't have that context. Learning from potential customers is very interesting and can be helpful, particularly for marketing, but it's not validated necessarily because those customers have not yet put money down, so to speak, and have been successful in the long run with your product. So I would always start with your existing existing happily paying customers, and then you can supplement with other types of research after that. So this is sort of like the foundation. And we use jobs to be done to not only guide the style of research, but also encapsulate or sort of capture what we learn. So we use, we we lean really heavily actually on customer job statements, as simple as they are, to help not only us while we're doing the research and making decisions about how to prioritize different groups, but also for the teams that we work with to understand in sort of an instance, so to speak, and really easily understand like, what are these customers trying to accomplish? What do they need to see in our product? And and what are those desired outcomes that they were seeking out? And that's like just that customer job statement, which is included in a couple of spots in the book. If you can take that research from those amazing customers of yours, those customers you want to like clone, so to speak, and articulate what they were trying to do in this customer job statement, then you can you can think about those customers through that very sort of strategic lens. You may also do that customer research, by the way, and identify that there's two different jobs to be done here, right? That hap- actually happens. I won't say it happens all the time, but it does happen quite often where we're working with companies where there's like two or three sets, you know, customer jobs that show up in the research. And then there's a decision to be made. You know, do we want to continue to serve all three of these customers or is there one that we want to lean into? Do we want to park one for a moment and, and prioritize another? That happens a lot where, you know, especially in, in situations where you can imagine like, oh, we want a low touch, you know, SMB offering and we want a more robust, a higher touch offering and we still want to be able to serve both of those customers but we can't optimize for both of those customers with all the same sort of materials and experience so we need to pick one park the others momentarily and sort of go forward with the with the you know customer mapping process and then go back later and do the same for those other more managed or higher touch customers who may have very different needs coming through the front door, very different needs for their evaluation, uh, you know, process. And there's all, you know, that, that higher touch sort of way to operationalize that. So you're conducting this research. You're not just going to end up with like this homogeneous list of like, okay, well, here they are. Great. Now we understand our customers. You're actually going to see, oh, shit, look at that. There, some of these customers came through and I'm glad they're successful, but truthfully, do we want more of them? Probably not. So let's, you know, eliminate that group and focus on this like higher value, you know, group that you want to scale and and do a better job of of optimizing for. So in this conversation, we've covered the first piece of the three parts of your book. The first part is getting inside your customers' heads. And if folks want to dig to the next part, which is mapping your customers' experiences and then operationalizing your customer insights, 
They should head to Amazon.com, search for Forget the Funnel or ForgetTheFunnel.com. Now, question for you. It's on Kindle and physical copy. Do you have an audiobook on the way? We have recorded the audiobook. It is currently being edited. Edited? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So side jag here. I just finished my recording the audiobook of SAS Playbook yeah. like last week, and I have an editor cranking on it. And of course, I listen back and I'm like, oh, should have said that part different. And I was hammering an hour a day, just every day, seven days a week until I got it done. I was doing it on weekends because I could do it at my house, right? And I was just like, yeah. but I can't do more than an hour because it was driving me nuts. So I, I really just want to hear like, what was your experience like recording the audiobook? And you have two authors. Mm-hmm. Did you get together in the same place? We were in Denver, Rob. At MicroConf. <laughs> yes. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's why I was in Denver. And so Claire came to speak at the event and she was like, I'm going to be in Denver. Do you want to meet up? And I was like, hell yes. So we were in the same location. We didn't have to record in the same location, but we kind of wanted to. We did it in a day. That's holy in moly. One day, the two of it. I mean, advantage, two authors, Two authors. Right? Two authors and it's 160 but, pages. So like it's manageable, but it. that's still got to be, that must have been six hours of recording. Yeah. 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 About that. Well, I, well, full recording. I think it's going to, once it gets edited down, it'll I, edit down to what three and a half, four, I would think four hours. That's right. Yeah. But it was rough because we were in Denver and both, do you remember Claire getting up on stage and saying like, I'm losing my voice? Yes. So I landed and she was like, I'm losing my voice. I don't even know if I can speak tomorrow, let alone the audiobook." And then I proceeded to lose my voice. So we were both pretty rough. She had recovered and I was, I had not quite recovered yet. So chapter too. I'm like real nasally. It's terrible. Like you smoke a smoke two packs that day. Oh, it's going to be oh, good. No. And now that has how everyone will think of your voice. It's been, yeah. it's going to be on audible.com for <laughs> We may have to re-record. I might listen to it and be like you and be like, no way I've got to re-record this. I'm, I'm nervous to hear it truthfully. Yeah. Well, I, it'll, I'm excited for it. And again, folks can head to Amazon, forget the funnel. And then you on Twitter are G G I I A A. Yeah. That's a that's a cool. So it's kind of like Gia, but it's doubling all the letters. G G I I A A. Yeah, that was my uh, very very poor choice back in like late early early. It was January 2009 and I could have gotten my first name, but I was like Twitter. Oh, that's a three I didn't letter. Take it. I could have gotten Georgiana. Oh, oh, Georgiana, yeah, I could have yeah. got. Yeah, not yeah. So I couldn't have gotten the GIA, but Georgiana, I could have had my first name and I didn't take it because I was like, ah, oh, whatever. This is for fun. Yeah. Nope. Good old Twitter. Turned in. It was like 13 years ago or something. Well, 14 years ago. and we'll see. Uh, each, each week I wonder how long Twitter is going to be around, but. I know, I know. Anyways, Same. thanks for taking the time to come on and talk Forget the Funnel. Thanks for having me, Rob. Thanks so much to Gia for coming on the show. And thanks for listening this week and every week. Here's another bad joke from ChatGPT. As a startup founder, I've learned that naming your company is a bit like naming your child. You spend ages thinking about it, you finally pick one, and then you find out someone else on the playground has the same name. This is Rob Walling signing off from episode 665.